Medicine Institute, and I will give a little bit of background on NC Agri-Medicine necessarily, um, but I serve as the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network Coordinator, and we are excited to have everyone here and really honored to have the opportunity to participate um, and help host this webinar today on farm succession and our farm stress work. It's been a common topic of added stress for our farmers and farm family members. And we are excited to partner with FarmLink to start the conversation on farm succession and then kind of continue to see as our work group develops what other opportunities we have to increase education, knowledge, and resources for not only our extension agents, but also other individuals working in agriculture and then our farmers and farm family members as well. So this webinar today is really just succession planning and resources to help get you started. Um, so as I said, there we go. The North Carolina Agromedicine Institute is actually a partnership between three um, universities. For those of you who are not familiar, that would be North Carolina State University, North Carolina A&T, and then East Carolina University. Um, we are housed at East Carolina University. And the primary reason for that is our focus is on health and safety. Um, so we really are tied into ECU's health care programs um, and resources. And then also at the time of the Institute's establishment, a lot of our larger farms here in North Carolina were east of I-95 and the location at East Carolina gave us the opportunity to really be engaged in that area. However, we do serve all 100 counties and the Cherokee Reservation. Um, so we like to say that we're all over the place and anywhere that has an extension office, we are also working very closely in partnership. So the Institute works to promote the health and safety of farmers, fishermen, foresters, their workers and their family. And we do that through research, prevention, intervention and education outreach. So we have a really fun job in that we are not regulatory and we're not in advocacy. So we fall in this nice neutral bubble of education and prevention intervention. Um, and so we get to be in our neutral zone of doing our outreach, increasing awareness of ways to prevent injury or prevent disease within our agricultural population while not having that maybe daunting appearance that we maybe would have if we were in a regulatory or advocacy place. We fall in that fun neutral zone. Um, and this is just a brief overview of some of the general health and safety programs that we offer here at the Institute. And we can share some more links on this information later. And here at the bottom of the slide, you'll also see a link to our website for more information on those. I won't go too in depth, um, but our Fit to Farm is our general health and safety outreach that we do. We have nurses on staff who are able to do anything from medication education for um, diabetes or blood pressure adherence, et cetera, general health screenings at outreach events. We do um, vital signs, O2 stats. We can also do blood sugar to check on regular glucose monitoring for our farmers at events in recognition that maybe farmers aren't regularly seeing primary care providers for a multitude of reasons and being able to go on from there and be able to screen if there are issues popping up. Our North Carolina Agribility Program allows us to offer um, equipment changes or specialty equipment and things of that nature for individuals who maybe are disabled or differently abled so that they are able to continue farming. Um, respiratory protection here in North Carolina for anyone who has a pesticide license, they are required to have respirator fit testing annually as well as medical clearance. So we're able to offer those and actually getting ready to go into busy season here the beginning of the year with renewals for all of those. Um, first on scene trains first responders and individuals in agricultural communities how to respond to farm accidents. Um, our NC specialty crop and child and safety 
and agritourism are both grants that we have. The specialty crop block grant it allows us to offer a cost share program for health changes on specialty crops um, farms. And then the child health and safety and agritourism lets us work with farms who have agritourism operations and make changes and recommendations to ensure the safety of those children, as well as those who are in charge of chaperoning those children. And then lastly, we have our grain bin safety, which is obviously how to safely maneuver inside of a grain bin and what you need to be doing to ensure that no one becomes trapped within a grain bin. And it also trains on how to respond in grain bin entrapment situations. There's a number of other programs and it's a pretty long list. So if there's anything that, you know, I didn't say that you're interested in, definitely check out the North Carolina Agromedicine website. But also we like to say that if it's not listed, we are more than happy to kind of adapt a curriculum and offer a new training. And we love working in that space as well. Um, so if you don't see it, don't hesitate to reach out because most of the time, if you want it done, we can find a way to do it. So I'm gonna pass it to Hannah really quickly for an introduction to FarmLink. Hey y'all, so FarmLink is um, a program through NC State Extension. And so we are servicing the entire state. Um, and with that, our goal is to connect farm seekers and landowners, um, either farming or non-farming landowners, to keep farmland in farming. Um, we have an online database we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but that's kind of the general gist. We have a lot of online resources and we're partnering with extension agents and other agricultural professionals across the state to provide farm succession, transition, um, land access resources to either side of the spectrum of farmers. And we'll talk more about that later. Thank you, Hannah. I'm going to do better to project my voice and hopefully my mic won't keep cutting in and out on us. I'm going to stop screen share here and we are going to bring our panelists on to start off this panel conversation. Michaela, if you would like to introduce yourself to start, that would be wonderful. Yeah, everybody. Thank you for being here and letting us uh kind of share with you a little bit more about farm succession planning. Um, like Courtney said, my name is Michaela Robinette. I'm a fifth generation farmer from Edgecombe County. Historically, we were a row crop operation. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, late 90s, we transitioned to beef cattle um, and have been doing that ever since. Uh, and I'm here today kind of in two hats. Um, I work as the resource specialist for uh, the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network, which is under the Agromedicine Institute. Um, and I'm also here to participate on the panel as a farmer. So excited to be here. Judith, if you would like to introduce yourself, please. Now, hi, uh, I'm Judith Ogden. I'm the uh, mediation director for um, we called the organization NCAMP. It stands for North Carolina Agricultural Mediation Program. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of background, because I find that many people have not heard of us. Um, back in the 80s, not, not going too far back, I guess, um, farmers were suffering financially, and uh, Congress passed a law to... Um, um, provide free mediation services for farmers. And the problem was that um, the farmers were um, having financial problems. They were defaulting on their loans, especially with the federal government and the federal government was foreclosing. And so Congress thought, well, if we provide free mediation, provide a mediator to sit down with the government agency and with the uh, farmer, maybe they can come up with some solution to save the farm. Um, and so the program has been going since then. There are 43 states that have um, a program like that. We are located at uh, Western Carolina University um, and we provide um, really 
any kind of agricultural mediation services. We started out just working with the federal government and farmers, um, but our job has been expanded uh, since then. So we will um, provide free mediation for any type of um, dispute involving agriculture. Um, of course, the federal government if they are party, they have to participate. If um, the mediation involves two private individuals, they have to agree to do it. We can't compel them to do it, but we've done, you know, mediations over lease agreements and um, neighbor disputes, you know, where agriculture is an issue. In the last um, farm bill, and hopefully we'll get another one soon, <laughs> in the last farm bill, um, the uh, Congress also um, authorized us to provide credit counseling, which we can do, you know, financial, some financial counseling, and to help with farm succession planning. And um, all of our mediators are trained in um, farm succession planning, and they've all been working with farmers for a long time. So that's why I'm here today, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. And Nick, I will open it to you. Hey, so I'm Nick Addison. And uh, like Michaela, I'm wearing several hats today as well. So as one, I serve as the resource conservationist for Brown Creek Soil and Water here in Anson County. And uh, our, our general focus uh, is to provide cost share assistance to address natural resource concerns, uh, among other things, but that's the, the priority. And then additionally, I'm also the Farm Health Connector uh, for a pilot program. It uh, covers five counties. It's Anson, Duplin, Pitt, Wilkes, and Robinson, I believe. Uh, so, and that's a, a new pilot program. I think it's been running for about mm, 12, 14 months or something like that. Um, and it's just a, it's a way for, to tailor fit social services and needs specifically to the agricultural community. So, you know, if, if, if someone has trouble uh, uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, it's they can reach out to these connectors and we can put them in contact with uh, groups and organizations or entities that are able to assist them in, in whatever they may need. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll try and wear two hats today and we'll see where that takes us. All right. Thank you, Nick. And yes, as Nick mentioned, our Farm Health Connector pilot is part of some of the farm stress funding we have. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's really great to have people that can make those unique connections, especially in day to day work. Um, so as we move to the panel, I think you'll see we have some unique backgrounds and skills here. So I think this is going to be a really strong and interesting conversation of differing backgrounds, being able to offer insight. Michaela, if you are okay, I will start with you. Um, I know you recently went through the succession planning process on your family farm. Um, can you just share a little bit about, you know, how that went for you and then how that maybe impacted dynamics on the farm or how that maybe impacted stress levels among your family members? Yeah, Courtney. Um, so our farm story is, I feel like it's unique and also very similar to a lot of other people that might be on this call today. Um, so the farm was passed down on my mom's side of the family. So between uh, my grandparents uh, on my maternal side. And so um, when my great, great granddad uh, had kids, he split the farm between his kids and then they split the farm between their kids and so forth. And so we, we're operating on about a quarter of the original property um and we always knew whenever my parents got married and they moved over to to cattle that um farming is going to be something that we want to continue doing um and something that my brother and I want to keep on the land um and we always kind of knew okay we need to put this in writing and make this a reality and legalize it rather than us just saying oh well this is our intent, right? Um, but things didn't really become real to us until about five years ago um, when my granddad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, and suddenly 
making farm decisions became extremely important because he was the sole owner on all of our paperwork. Um, and pretty soon, if we didn't transfer anything over, um, pr prior to his official diagnosis, we knew that there was going to be the risk of it being contested in court um, and of him not being of sound body and mind to be able to make important decisions like this. Um, and so for us, our journey uh, really began and has kind of halted with uh, my parents uh, sitting down with a lawyer or my grandparents sitting down with a lawyer um, and two of their closest friends and writing out their will um, in terms of who gets what parts of the farm um, and what their intent is for the continuation of the farm. Um, and as a grandchild, I kind of was able to stay out of those in-depth conversations of what that looked like um, in terms of the details. Um, and unfortunately, my granddad did pass away in May. And so now those uh, decisions that he made whenever he was still able to are coming to light. Um, and so now in terms of the succession planning piece, it's kind of fallen on my mom and I. Um, to maintain the integrity of what his wishes were in terms of, um, you know, who gets what pieces as well as, um, you know, things as simple as, okay, like don't tear, cut down the timber on this portion of the land if you can help it. And here's all of the ways that I protect it and help make sure that um, you won't have to, to resort to other means in order to keep the farm running. And so, um, now we're in the process of setting up a revocable trust for the for the property, um, and we're going to be doing that later this year, fortunately, um, but a lot of those decisions had to get put on hold, um, and I think it would have been a lot easier if we kind of operated his Alzheimer's diagnosis, knowing that we had a firm succession plan in place and knowing that all of the land was under one name uh, instead of the past five years where we've been, you know, finding out, oh, you know, the second cousin owns uh, this piece of land and my uncle apparently owns the land that the family cemetery is on and it's not my granddad's land like we thought. Um, and so uh, essentially farm succession planning is messy and you think you can come to an end and you have your problem solved, but you come to find out that you don't. Um, and so it's just constantly a dynamic flow um, that you just always have to be willing to to kind of adapt with the new circumstances that come up. Thank you, Michaela. Um, let's see. Nick, I know Michaela mentioned a little bit about trust and resources. Um, I know you talked a little bit about cost share programs and how those dynamics can add an added complication into farm succession planning conversations as that process starts. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah. So like Michaela alluded to, I mean, it's one thing to have uh, ownership kind of get lost in, in just family histories that, you know, I'm sure, you know, here in the South, we're all pretty friendly. So, you know, if it's your uncle's land, you know, it's almost your land and vice versa. But uh, so luckily those can be kind of easy to hunt down through deeds and records and, you know, that sort of thing. But there's other programs that exist that is offered through uh, county programs, state programs and federal programs, uh, where it's cost share assistance. Uh, so basically we provide cost share monies for projects to be implemented. And so those are things that really need to be somewhere in some kind of farm record so that if the owner generation sh should suddenly pass and not have a chance to tell you that information can be handed down because what you don't want to happen is to have some sort of cost share program uh, be implemented on your property and then you're found to be out of compliance um, because then you have to pay back at a prorated rate um, if you're out of compliance or you know if, if the property sold yeah, you need to make sure that the new owner is either willing to accept that uh, cost share contract or you have to buy yourself out. And then, uh, you know, another thing to be aware of is we're seeing more and more uptake in conservation easements and now even agricultural easements. 
And luckily a lot of those are recorded on the deed, but it's just, it's just something to be aware of, uh, especially when it comes to a term length or one that's in perpetuity, um, because that won't impact, not, it will impact the current generation, but if it's one in perpetuity, it's going to impact the future generations as well. And so those are things to be aware of just when you're doing succession planning and trying to plan for the future is to realize that some of these things uh, will last way longer than you will. So it's just something to be aware of. Thank you, Nick. Um, Judith, as we talk about beginning the conversation around farm succession and the importance of mediation services, can you tell us a little bit about how those services can benefit farmers and farm family members? Okay, so um, our mediators, uh, when they're meeting with a family, they use a lot of the same skills they would use in any kind of mediation. And so, um, you know, depending on the circumstances and the issues involved within the family, and you know, everyone, every situation is a little bit different. Um, but the mediators try to um, improve communication, um, increase um, and improve listening skills. Um, they help the family to identify what are some of the issues, what are some of the, you know, the problems that are going to um, come up. And sometimes, of course, there's already uh, conflict within the family and, and, um, and maybe mistrust. And so the mediator tries, well, tries to bring them to the point where they can, um, um, if not resolve the conflict and the mistrust, at least be able to um, work together and um, and try to come up with, um, you know, a way to discuss all of the potential issues. And so um, they try to um, help them identify the goals. Like, you know, everybody has may have their own idea about what do we want the farm to be? But in addition, people have um, their individual individual goals. You know, everybody doesn't want to stay on the farm. Um, and so if um, the original plan was, you know, I have six kids, they're all going to work on the farm, I'm going to write a will and leave it to the six kids, that could be a real problem because some of them, you know, may not want to. So um, the, the mediators will meet with the the whole family, um, but they'll also meet with the individuals because they all have their own ideas about, you know, what it is that they want to do and what they want to see. So, you know, I guess overall what they're trying to determine is, you know, where's the farm now? Where do we want the farm to be? And um, how, we can, how are we going to get there? Um, the mediators are not lawyers. They're not providing legal advice. They're just trying to help the family discuss what it is that they um, that they want, you know, long term. And um, and then at some point, you may have to go to an attorney and have a will drafted or whatever. But um, early on, they're really trying to help the family determine what it is that they want in terms of the long term goal for the um, for the farm. Thank you, Judith. All right, Michaela, I'm going to come back to you. Um, can you share about the tools or means your family used to pardon me, navigate some of those tough conversations um, through the succession planning process? Um, absolutely. So our biggest resource was our family lawyer um, who has been in our pocket uh, for pretty much the past 20 years in our agricultural history. Um, and he was a great wealth of information. Um, and we are very fortunate that we were able to have him not only as our lawyer, but as our friend uh, during this process. Uh, I will also say we pulled a lot of information from ag mediation uh, going through how to have those difficult conversations, um, as well as, again, fortunate family circumstances. My mom is a high school guidance counselor, so she does have counseling training um, and was able to kind of use those uh, methods and, and ways of, of mediation of having those conversations with difficult family members and difficult um 
difficult topics. Um, and so, because like Judith and Nick said, not everybody plans on on what on what this is going to look like, and and you know, a owner generation can make a decision for for their children that their children might not necessarily agree with, which we did experience. Um, and so, just having those t- schools those tools and skills uh, to navigate those conversations were super helpful. Thank you. Um, Nick, if you can share, this is kind of using both of your hats as a farm health connector and in your day-to-day work, but what are some barriers that you've come across when working to encourage farmers and their families to develop and maintain a succession plan? Yeah, so I would say the biggest problem that we come across is uh, it's always seen, farm succession planning specifically, is always seen as a problem that can be solved at a later date, and uh, it's never addressed until that later date is now, uh, when some some unforeseen or uh, accident happens or there's a death in the family, and that that's what we would like to avoid um, just because it it causes so many issues uh, in terms of succession planning, but that seems to be the biggest barrier is uh, people just getting this mindset is, ah, you know, I'll do it next week and next week comes and you'll say, well, I'll do it next month and the next month becomes next year. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I've had a few people, you know, they, they're interested in developing these plans and they think it, it's a weekend project and it's not. Uh, this is something that's going to take, months and in many cases years because it's it's not like you can just sit down and hash all this out and put it on paper and call it done um and just like Michaela alluded to you know she said in her experience it's taken them several years because they have to hunt down information and then found out different ownerships and these sorts of things so it's, it's a lengthy process and they also need to understand that say you finish it well at that point, it needs to be a living document. Uh, you want to update it as things change and just keep it uh, as a living document. Uh, and I think that really sets them up for success going down the road. But the barrier is, is just taking those first few big steps to get the ball rolling. Thank you, Nick. Um, Judith. As we go through again, talking about those difficult things that we manage, especially in our roles, you talked a little bit about some of the difficult things to manage, but can you elaborate on those from your perspective as well? Well, for our program, I guess the biggest um, problem is trying to get the word out, letting people know that we're available that um, and that we can help. And there's a real benefit in, um, you know, meeting with us and as i say you know we survive on federal grants so there's no there's no charge so i think it's a good place to start um start the discussion um so part of the problem is is of course getting the um the word out and i guess um other than that it's probably what what nick said that um you know it's never too early to start so you know i think it's it's similar to even if you didn't have a farm, if you had minor children, you know, even though they're very young, you need a will or early on because you need to have, make decisions about guardianship and and things like that. And I think that that's the way um, this is, too. You need to think early on because anything could happen and suddenly um, the parents are gone and, and nobody knows what it is that that needs to be done. Um, and as Nick also said, I think it's important that periodically you have to, you know, as things change, you have to go back and review it. So it's not like, okay, I've done, I've done it once and I have a will and I talk to the attorney and everything is fine. It's something that as things change and your life is going to change and your children are going to grow up and have different ideas, um, you need to review it periodically. Thank you, Judith. Michaela, I have an audience question for you. Um, What was your family's experience like navigating probate and how long did it take you to work through that process? You're muted. Sorry. Sorry. 
Sorry about that. That's a great question, Stephen. Um, and so essentially, um, I'm and again, I'm having to Google probate to make sure that I <laughs> am telling you correctly. Um, yes. Okay. So, um, and I'm just going to read the definition. For those of you who don't know what probate is, it's the legal document which gives you authority to share out the estate of the person who has died. Um, so it's the executor of the will. Um, is kind of how I've been referring to it as. And with that, so my mom has actually been the executor of my granddad's estate um, and navigating a lot of those kind of conversations. Um, however, uh, it is definitely something that we're still working on um, and we're finding out every day things that he did that um, are like putting little kinks in our plans. Uh, for example, my granddad stopped farming in the 90s um, and went to work for a tobacco processing plant. And we didn't know until after his death. So 10, 15 years after he retired um, that he had life insurance. And so it's things like that that we're having to navigate and go through. OK, what are all of the possible areas? He had an insurance policy that none of us knew about. He had a bank account that none of us knew about. Um, so it's, again, one of those things that as we think that we got somewhere and we're done, all of those pieces are going back into place. So like what Nick said, you want to make sure that everything is written down. So that way your, your living uh, family don't have to go through this guessing game, right? Um, and so with that, with the probate process, we're still going through it. In terms of the farm, um, it probably, I would say in total, took about a month to get everything switched over um, in terms of farm numbers and deeds and making sure that everything was put in my grandma's name um, and then making sure that her uh, executors of her will are, are prepared to get, undergo all of that. Um, but definitely like echoing again what Judith and Nick said, it's been a living process and, and dynamic and um just when you think you get one thing done you you have to go back and say wait a second there was another step that we missed um and so yeah thank you Michaela all right I have a question for the three of you all it's a little broad we can do our best to get to it and if we can't fully answer it we can definitely get some resources and find some information afterwards but the question is that members of someone's extended family experienced an unexpected loss. The farm was placed in the son's ownership because his parents had been aging, but unfortunately the son is the one who passed and there is no will or a succession plan. What advice would there be to this family as a place to get started? I don't, I don't understand the part about it the what exactly what it was exactly the son's rule it says that it, the farm had been placed in his ownership because of aging parents so he owned it yes ma'am well a really simple answer is he owned it doesn't have a will state and testacy law would take over and as the family began to yeah. move forward in that process, I guess for those who aren't familiar with what could happen in a situation where there wasn't a will or succession plan and that law does take over, what does that process look like for a family, Judith, if you can elaborate? Well, the state law will tell you who his heirs are if he didn't write a will. And I don't know if he had a spouse or children or whatever, his next of kin. Um, so they would have to go into court. I mean, there's no way around that. I think you're going to have to hire an attorney and go into court and and have the court determine, um, you know, who who his heirs are. Um, but it's probably unfortunate because probably, you know, he was probably just supposed to be a temporary guardian of the farm and other heirs thought they might have, um, you know, a claim on it, but they may not. They may not. So I don't know. The moral is always write a will, but um, yeah. but I think that's what I I don't see what else would happen if you die without a will. State law determines who your heirs are, and I and um, it's oftentimes unfair, 
and unfortunate, but I don't think there's any way around it, you know, unless the heir, unless the heirs are willing to negotiate with other people in the family, which would be very generous, but there's no legal requirement to do that. Yeah. And I'm just going to follow up with that. So whenever a person dies without a will and the property gets passed on, it's something called heirs property. And this is being uh, increasingly uh, more discussed talk uh, discussed topic uh, within agricultural circles. Um, without legal claim to the land, they can't sell any products. They can't do make any money. They can't operate as a farm essentially um, without that legal ownership. And so, um, my advice is get in touch with ag mediation. Get in touch with a lawyer, and the best thing that they can do to continue the legacy of the farm as a farm is come to an agreement and like Judah said they're not legally obligated to come to an agreement where there is one owner um but that's the the best thing that they can do if they want to keep the farm in operation all right Nick I have a more conservation aimed question. So I think this is going to fall in your court, but there's a local farmer who's interested in a conservation easement and has been working with local land conservancy. Um, but a question around that is, could he conserve sections of the land for small farm and keep certain sharecroppers as succession happens? Yes. Yeah, so just in general terms, because when you get when you start working with these 5013Cs or, or even the state conservation easement programs, every program's a little different as, as to how they're structured. So I, I don't want to go into specifics, um, but I would say generally, yes. I mean, if, if that program is willing to accept only five acre lots, uh, you know, I don't think there's any issue with setting aside five acres. I, th I think the only one th the one advisement I would give is just remember that a lot of these ag easements or, or, na or natural resource easements are in perpetuity. So when you set aside that five acres, just remember that that five acres is forever going to be locked up as ag land. You can't come back in 10 years and build a house there. Um, but every program's a little different. So I, it's, it's kind of tough to go into specifics um, on that one. All right, Michaela, I'm going to come back to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how knowing you had a succession plan fed into peace of mind as your grandfather's Alzheimer's progressed and you all were able to see the next steps for the family farm? Yeah, absolutely. So um, and I have a younger brother um, who's five years younger. And one of the things that he and I always growing up, we told each other is we will not be the generation that loses the farm. Um, and, you know, if something happens in my grandparents' generation or my parents' generation where our farm is no longer operating, that's fine. We are we are still going to be a family at the end of the day. Um, but he and I are very determined that as we get older and we start getting married and having children that this will be available to them like it was available to us um and so we kind of grew up with that legacy pressure of and it was self-imposed it wasn't from our parents or our grandparents but we want that for ourselves um and so once the succession plan was in place um prior to him getting my granddad getting formally diagnosed and um it made life a lot easier knowing that for the time being, we had a Band-Aid on an issue that would carry us out through his diagnosis. And for the time being, we could breathe, right? Um, and know that, um, you know, family members that that are, are involved in the farm, but don't have the same ambitions with the farm, can't take it away from us and can't um, come in and, and do something that we don't want to before it's technically mine and my brother's. Um, and so now, again, that my granddad has passed, we're 
going through the living document part of this process where we are making those revisions and are saying um, doing the revocable trust where um, those decisions are a little bit more cemented. Um, and so the stress is back up right um, right now, but for the past five years, when we had that succession plan in place and the wills were in place, it gave us the opportunity to appreciate my granddad as my granddad and not necessarily my granddad as a landowner, um, which was very important during that process. Thank you. And as we begin to wrap up the panel portion of this discussion, I would like, at least for our panelists, if there's anything else that you would like people to know as they begin to navigate or to talk about how important it is to start to consider navigation of farm succession planning, um, feel free to unmute yourselves and share that information um, with the group. Well, I can start. Um, <laughs> I just would really encourage if you do not have a succession plan in place or don't know where to begin, or like Nick said, if it's something you've been telling yourself that you need to do but haven't got around to it, um, I just highly recommend that you make that a priority, um, especially going into the holidays. I, I know nobody wants to add extra stress, but whenever you're together with your family, it's a great time to have those conversations about, um, you know, what the next steps are going to be and, um, you know, what, what that plan looks like for you all. Um, and if you have that opportunity when it's not a high stress situation, when somebody is not literally on a hospital bed waiting for them to pass this is the best time to do it um and so and if you need any support or or you know need somebody to convince you any further i'm happy to happy to have that conversation and help hold your hand through it yeah M michaela uh took the best answer but uh i, I definitely will reiterate that because I, I think that is one of the biggest hurdles and where it's such a big hurdle just to get the ball rolling. A lot of people don't even try and cross that hurdle. And then we come into situations like we've seen in the chat and, and you know, people are just at a loss because now they have to deal with it. And so I really think and stress people, uh, even if you're not ready to sit down pen and paper, at least just start the conversations with the family members, even just to fill them out. Um, but in some shape or form at least start the process uh sooner than later well i guess i would say since i'm a mediator i really believe that um it's not the only way to do to do this and if your family um doesn't really have a lot of conflict and you're and you're able to talk to each other um that's fine but um you know i really think there's benefits sometimes in bringing in a third party who has no interest in um what's going on um their experience they've done this before um and you know it may be beneficial just to get the conversation started um i I'm not too sure I do it over the Christmas holidays. That seems like a stressful time, but you're right. Everybody would be there, but, um, you know, we provide, um, the service for free. So, um, you know, if you don't like the people we said, you can, there are people you can pay to help you do this. They're not attorneys or accountants or whatever. They just, um, you know, talk to you about, the things that we've been um, talking about, but I think there's a real benefit in bringing in, um, as I say, an impartial third party. They may raise issues that you never thought about. Um, and, you know, you don't, um, at least it gets the conversation started. You know, I know we use a lot of forums about what are your finances? What are your debts? What are, you, what's, what are all these kind of things? And, you know, maybe you've already addressed all that um, and maybe you haven't. But um, I think it's probably worth, as I say, if you don't have to pay for it, bringing in somebody to 
to um, get the conversation started. And then eventually you're going to have to have an attorney and probably an accountant and other professionals. But, um, you know, you initially you just want to talk about what do we want? How are we going to get there? You know, what's our long term plan? Thank you all three and thank you all for participating on the panel and thank you all in the chat for participating with some real application questions. Um, all of the contact information and slides will be shared prior or following this. Um, and as long as our panelists are okay with it, I can share their emails if you would like to reach out with them to get more information on some of those more specific questions. Um, but as we really got to today, you all can see just how stressful the farm succession conversation is, um, which is kind of what we were hoping to showcase here as we started to talk about why succession planning was important, um, and then talk a little bit about some farm stress resources through the Institute that are available. Um, and then Hannah will share about some resources that FarmLink has available. So at this time, I'm going to reshare my screen and I'm actually going to pass it over to Michaela to share about some of our farm stress resources that we have mm -hmm. to offer to hopefully help people navigate the stress of succession planning. Yeah, so... Um, the Agri-Medicine Institute works in partnership with the with several different groups uh, here in North Carolina, including uh, the Corn Growers Association, Tobacco Trust Fund, um, CareNet Counseling, uh, Eastern AHEC, and Farm Credit, and like today, the Cooperative Extension. Um, and so truly, we couldn't do the work that we do without in a silo. So we try and get as many other agricultural groups involved as possible. Um, and so some of our main programs include a uh, farm stress awareness training. So things like today, um, where we're discussing areas of farm stress to a group, um, as well as just general um, stress programming and what that looks like and how you can help alleviate some of the stress in your life. Um, and then the other piece of that, so we can talk a lot of about it, but if without, uh, works without deeds is, you know, nothing, right? And so um, we try to do a lot with uh, providing health services to folks in North Carolina agriculture. Uh, and we do that through our partnership with CareNet Counseling. And so uh, our behavioral health services are free to any person in North Carolina agriculture um, where who is interested in receiving uh, confidential private uh, counseling or therapy services. And we also offer psychiatry care uh, through ECU. Um, and so these programs, uh, you can meet in person or you can meet virtually, um, but it's a great way uh, to kind of alleviate that burden of holding all of your stress in um, and be able to share that with uh, a confidential counselor therapist um, in a way that can help you uh, grow not only as personally, but also within your operation. So Courtney, do you want to go to the next slide? Awesome. Um, and so um, with that, uh, in addition to the counseling opportunities, um, we also do several farm stress uh, or several mental health trainings um, that are all free of charge again. Um, so part of that is farm stress awareness. Um, but then we also offer mental health first aid training, both for adults with for other adults and then adults who work with youth um, free of charge, uh, as well as QPR, which is an hour and a half long uh, training on for, on suicide and suicide prevention and how to ask those difficult conversations. Uh, we are working on being able to provide calm training, which is counseling access for lethal means, um, which is again, another suicide prevention training. Um, and then another one that we offer is farm theater, uh, which is a great thing if you're ever are interested in bringing it to your extension meetings or to your community groups, uh, where we can kind of discuss some of these stress uh, related topics uh, in a more casual setting and, a, and through a role play environment. Um, that can kind of open up your group and introduce these topics in a less uh, 
heavy manner. Um, and then additionally, uh, we do offer trainings and services related to uh, farm financing and management, as well as legal consultants. So we have funds uh, available where if you are in need of financial consultations um, or legal consultations, uh, we can help connect you with one of those folks, as well as help pay for the service. Um, so if that is a barrier right now for you all, uh, please do not hesitate to get in touch with uh, Courtney or I, and we are happy to make that connection. And then again, the behavioral health services that we offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Courtney, you want to? Yeah. Um, and so the other piece with all of this is, um, as we all know, agriculture can definitely be a isolating job um, where you don't really see many people outside of your family or your or you know your specific community right um, and so with that um, that social isolation is a huge area of stress for our folks in ag um, and so here at the agri-medicine institute we have enacted the uh, farmer to farmer program. Uh, so this program is again available to anybody in agriculture, uh, whether you are the farmer or the farm wife um, or farm spouse, um, where if you just need someone to confidentially and non-judgmentally talk about what's going on in your world um, and receive that support from another peer, uh, this program is available to you again, free of charge, um, but we will match you with a, another farmer uh, who we try to do within the same commodity, but they will not be within your county or neighboring county to eliminate that area of competition um, and just give you that space to talk and be open with somebody. Um, and we are also uh, recruiting people for this program who are interested in being the farm mentors side of things. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're interested in participating in this program as sort of the mentor role, uh, feel free again just to contact Courtney or I, and we are happy to make that connection. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so um, with that, uh, this is the best way to get a hold of us uh, mm -hmm. for just general support. Um, and so the North Carolina Farm Helpline is a 24-7 crisis and resource line operated by the North Carolina Agri-Medicine Institute. Um, and we, again, couldn't do it without the support of our partners. Um, but we uh, are available at any point in any day uh, by phone call or by text message, where you'll be connected with a member of the agri-medicine staff uh, to get you connected to resources. Or if you're just experiencing a moment of stress or high uh, or a moment of even crisis where you just need to talk to somebody who understands, uh, we're available. Um, or again, if you just need to know before you start going down the Google rabbit hole, right, of um, I don't know what information I need, but I know I need something, give us a call. We are happy to make those connections. So for example, if you say, hey, I'm having a conflict on my farm uh, between myself and my landowner, and I don't know what to do, and I just need somebody to talk to and get me connected so that way I can fix this problem, we would say, oh, Judith Ogden at the North Carolina Ag Mediation Program is a perfect contact for you. Let's go ahead and get you support that way. Um, and so uh, all of those things, right, if you need legal, financial support, if you need medical care, um, if you are searching, again, ag mediation side of things, um, we keep a farm stress resource directory um, at the Agri-Medicine Institute. There's a version of it on our website um, however, we are working on making it a searchable database um, that should be kind of wrapping itself up within end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, so uh, eventually this will be a fully searchable database. But for right now, just give us a call, shoot us an email, um, shoot us a text, and we are happy to provide those resources for you. Courtney, if you want to click the next slide. Awesome. And so here's mine and Courtney's contact information. Uh, feel free again, just to give us a call at any point or give us an, shoot us an email. Um, and we're happy to kind of navigate some of these conversations with you. So, and thank you all. Courtney, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I will um, pass it over to Hannah, um, but thank you, Michaela and Hannah. 
I am going to pass to you and just let me know as you want these slides advanced. Mm -hmm. I'll put the right there for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're on mute. Thanks. <laughs> Classic. Um, okay, so from farmland perspective, um, with FarmLink, some things that we have on our radar um, that makes farm succession feel extra pertinent to us um, is the projected farmland loss. So this is um, looking at into 2040. Um, so with some like a little alarming statistics here of <laughs> we're growing a lot as a state population wise, which means that land is a hot commodity. Um, and with most farmers not having a will, it becomes a pretty sticky situation as we heard. Um, we get into heirs property, we get into land being sold for development, all of these different things. Um, and our farming population is aging with most of them being at least 58 or older, that's the median farming age, um, and a lot of them being over 65. You can go to the next slide, Courtney. Um, so what we're doing at FarmLink is um, working to try and work through that issue around land access, around um, farm transition and succession. And so we have our database online, um, and then we have a lot of resources and individual consultations that we do with folks. And so on our website that's listed here, um, all you have to do is go to there and then there's a, on the left-hand navigation, it's a little tricky. So I did screenshots of these, um, but you'll click the find a farm. And this is the page that'll pull up and you go down to that tab that says create a profile. And for find a farmer, it's similar. Um, and so if you're finding a farm, you're seeking land. If you're finding a farmer, you're looking for someone to farm your land or to pass your farm on to. And that can look like a lease, that can look like a sale, that can look like a mentorship or an incubator. Um, we have all sorts of different styles on there. And some folks will even um, post in jobs on there as well. Um, so we have a wide variety of resources. Next. Um, so on the note of succession, um, both Stephen, who is Stephen Bishop, is the Western Director for NC FarmLink, and Noah Rennells is the Eastern Director for us, and they are both offering um, farm succession consultations. So that can help for folks who are starting to think that it might be something they need. Um, our real recommendation is that even if you're in like your 30s, 40s, 50s, and you don't really feel like this is <laughs> um, your time to actually start having those conversations and be working towards it to at least get your will written, have an estate plan, all those things so that you don't end up in a tricky situation later. Um, but these are like one-on-one -on -one consultations that folks can sign up for, and they'll just at least understand where you're coming from, where you're at in the process, and what your next steps are from there. Next. Um, and here are some additional resources that we have. Um, we have a lot of folks looking for land where business planning farm schools and other production resources are helpful. And so I included some of those on there. We'll share all of this out with the slides. Um, and this also has Stephen and Noah's contact info. Um, and then before we close out, if we can have everyone participate in a little poll, <laughs> if um, we can share that. So I'm gonna launch it now. If before you leave, you'll take this for us. Um, and then we'll have another one along with our slides and resources in the follow-up email. I'm gonna stop recording now.